So let's look at some of the objectives for this presentation. Um, I've got eight here, and hopefully I can touch on those. Uh, again, it's going to be a ton of information. I have a lot of videos, things to share, so I'll try to get through it. Um, hopefully by 1245, I'll keep kind of checking the time. Um, so the first objective is going to be just to introduce some foundational literature and some of the available resources uh, for educators, parents, and anybody looking to expand their learning when it comes to outdoor play and outdoor education. Uh, second objective is going to be to look specifically at some of the occupational therapy roles and how those tie into outdoor education um, at schools and also with parents and then beyond that into um, just occupational therapy in outdoor settings outside of schools. Um, three, we're going to review childhood development and look at how the outdoors um, can sort of promote those areas of development and provide opportunities for uh, really honing in on some of those key fundamental things that uh, children get to um, experience as they as they grow up. Uh, four, I'm going to elaborate on some uh, ideas about outdoor play, um, introduce some concepts and kind of see, go through that and see what that looks like. Uh, number five, we'll discuss some specific ideas for outdoor play. Um, I've got a few things to bring up there that uh, maybe you guys know of, maybe you haven't heard of, so we'll touch on that. Um, number six, we'll look at environmental structuring. That's a huge part of what occupational therapists do. Uh, in the outdoors, there's so much to uh, incorporate, and we can look at ways that adults and teachers and parents can structure the environment to promote uh, the best opportunities for kids to learn. Uh, number seven, we'll review strategies for success, just kind of an overview of things that we can start doing uh, right away um, as, as educators uh, to just get our kids outdoors in a safe way that, um, again, is going to promote their best play and learning experiences. And then we'll kind of open it up for discussion and we'll take any questions that people have or things we want to go over and talk about. So let's look at some of the foundational literature and resources. Um, number one resource that I found just from my years of kind of looking at this stuff, there is a ton of research, but the absolute fundamental, I've got it right here, is um, a book by Angela Hanscom. She's a pediatric occupational therapist. Uh, she developed the camp, it's called Timber Nook. It's an outdoor occupational therapy based camp um, that really touches base on some of the uh, key occupational therapy concepts when it comes to pediatrics. Um, I recommend this book to anybody who has children, anybody who works with children, um, anybody who's just curious about uh, childhood development and the roles that the outdoors can play um, in kind of uh, promoting that. So this is definitely a good book to pick up. Um, I look at it often. Um, another book that's fundamental is Last Child in the Woods. This is written, uh, I think it was 2003. Again, looking at what um, has been called nature deficit disorder and looking at how a generation of children, our generation of children, um, has moved away from the outdoors and moved away from nature and some of the side effects of um, being indoors and being on screens and sort of uh, raising children with, with those things as a priority. So um, just a couple of fundamental books there. Uh, some, if you're looking for more of like the specific research um, aspects, uh, some of the outcome measures, things that are uh, peer reviewed, I've got a couple articles here on the left side. Uh, I have an entire library of articles about this and different topics. So if you're looking for more of the specific research stuff, feel free to shoot me an email. I've got it at the end in the last slide. Um, I've got an entire library of peer reviewed research that looks at um, outdoor opportunities for children. Um, and how that promotes their best outcomes. So um, specifically for educators on the right-hand side here, I've got some resources. Uh, I'll kind of go through those. The first one is called Educate Outside. Um, what this is, is it's an outdoor learning resource specifically for teachers. A lot of uh, information sharing and different um, structural ideas and projects and just uh, opportunities to, to kind of look at how to get outside and what's the best way to do that. Um, this one might be the best resource I have on here. Number two here, the National COVID-19 Learning Initiative. So the NC-19 is a free library of ideas and resources um, to look at using the outdoors for learning. Um, so this, is, this was developed during the pandemic, but they're expanding it beyond that. They actually just finished their um, kind of synopsis of things this, this month, March of this year. Um, it's a hundred different, hundreds of experts from different fields. Uh, they kind of met together and, and developed ways to safely return back to in-person learning in schools um, and using the outdoors as a way to do that. So that's a really good one to check out. 
I'm sure you guys know of Kaplan. Kaplan is a, a learning resource. Um, they have a specific learning resource for outdoor learning that's, that's there. And then Outdoor Classroom Day, uh, again, just another organization, another website with, um, it's actually a global movement, but they, um, their goal is to make outdoors part of um, every child's day. So every day children should be getting outside. That's sort of their, uh, their mission with that one there. So just some things to look at. Um, I'm gonna play this video here in the middle. It's um, by Laura Figueroa. She is the um, creator of Outdoor Kids Occupational Therapy. Again, uh, just another company that, that kind of hones in on these ideas. Um, she does talk about her specific company quite a bit here. Uh, the theory that she developed is definitely important. And then I want you guys to pay attention to just what you're seeing in the video with what the kids are doing outside because there's a ton of ideas in just this two minute video. So here's this. So Dave, the only thing is we just can't hear the sound. I didn't know if there was sound. Okay, there is sound. So let me see. Um, let's see. Is it better now? Is that working there when I turn the volume up? Not yet. Okay, hold on. And I just wonder, is it is it because when you go to share your video, when you go to share your screen on the bot, maybe you need to come out of screen sharing and then before you have, before you share, just hit when you're in, you know, hit share audio. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, share audio. So come out of. So come out of screen sharing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, when you, now when you go to share, if you look on okay. the bottom left-hand corner, there sound. Got it. Okay. There, perfect. Thank you. We'll get it. We'll get it going again. Uh, let's see. Thanks. Okay. So let's just skip forward. So a lot of good ideas here. Parents, if you're anything like me, you probably have the best intentions of getting your children outdoors in nature every week and giving them that green time that we know they need for their healthy development. And yet we live in an urban area and it often doesn't happen. At Outdoor Kids OT, we wanna be part of the solution to that problem. We call our solution the Contigo approach. Contigo is an acronym we developed at Outdoor Kids OT to stand for connecting kids with one another and transforming their development in the great outdoors. Our Contigo Kids OT groups always focus on building social skills, attention skills, motor coordination, self-regulation, and healthy sensory processing all through really fun, play-based therapeutic activities in nature, led by the occupational therapist. We celebrate neurodiversity by including children who are receiving OT services, as well as kids who are participating in the group as peer playmates. We like to say at Outdoor Kids OT that we help all kids become more coordinated, confident, calm, and caring. So if you're interested in your- Okay, so that's the gist of that one. Um, she touches on a lot of the OT concepts, which I think is good. Um, and you know, those videos just, she gives, there's a lot of good examples just in that video there. So I'll move forward with the next one here. Um, so we'll look at some OT roles specifically in outdoor education. Um, number one role, going to be working with educators. Uh, that's, again, just providing information, resources, um, working with parents. Uh, that's going to be things like reviewing the benefits of the outdoors, um, looking at the, the, being able to describe to them, you know, why their kids need to be outdoors, um, why it's important for kids to be outdoors during the school day, um, and just kind of making sure they're on the same page with their educators and um, other staff about that. Um, setting expectations, 
a lot of that just comes down to making sure they're okay with their kids being outside um, regardless of the weather, uh, making sure that their kids are prepared to be outside every day they come to school. Um, you know, there's different strategies for that as, as school staff and educators, um, but just, you know, being, having the parents be on the same page um, and, you know, allowing their kids to get outside, maybe get a little dirty, uh, go outside in the rain. Um, that's going to be really important to promoting these types of ideas at the school. Um, students, again, that's just promoting the mindset that outdoor play is a good experience. Um, there's a lot of learning to be done outdoors um, and framing the outdoors as kind of a healthy and happy place to be. Um, you know, beyond the classroom, there is a lot of learning in the outdoors. So uh, number two here, adapting and structuring, structuring environments and activities. Um, and that's to maximize occupational performance and participation. Uh, I'm sure all the OTs know that's our bread and butter. Uh, we look at environments, we look at activities, we break those down, and we look at ways that we can promote um, performance participation for uh, children, adults, older adults, whatever population we're working in. So that's just an OT fundamental right there. Um, another role that's important for any, any pediatric OT really is just assessing childhood developmental milestones. Um, when we look at the outdoors, we can uh, look at all the different opportunities that children have to work on those uh, areas of developmental growth um, and the outdoors just provide the, the perfect environment for that. And then lastly, just promoting uh, the ideas of health and wellness, overall well-being. Um, the outdoors, you know, personally and professionally, there's a lot of research that shows that the outdoors uh, are really good at promoting health and wellness. So um, OTs can be involved in all of those areas. So looking specifically at some of the areas of childhood development in the outdoors, and like I mentioned earlier, I have a ton of specific research about all of these um, developmental outcomes and the benefits of the outdoors experience. I'm just going to kind of list off a bunch from each one of these categories here on the right. Um, but there's research that shows that uh, the outdoors can help promote um, growth and, and positive outcomes in each of the things I'm about to say. So communication and cognition, we're looking at things like attention, problem solving, critical thinking, leadership skills, teamwork, environmental analysis, memory, confidence, and positive attitudes. When we talk about social and emotional development, we're looking at things like adaptability, foresight, opportunity taking, socialization, um, developing shared experiences with their peers, recall memory, uh, self-reflection and experiential reflection, emotional regulation, accepting and managing challenges, and building frustration tolerances. Um, when we look specifically at motor skills, motor skills we typically break down into two areas. We have gross motor skills, which are considered big movements, um, and we have fine motor skills, which are gonna be our small movements. So when we think about activities that we can do in the outdoors, uh, some of the gross motor movements that I that come up right away are going to be things like walking, jumping, climbing, running, skipping, leaping, um, hopping, sliding, pushing, pulling, swinging, swaying, um, you know, rising, falling, reaching, stretching, bending, twisting, turning, throwing, catching, uh, striking. Those are all important developmental areas. Uh, when it comes to motor skills and there's endless opportunities for all of those things in the outdoors. Uh, some of the fine motor skills, these are going to be like your pick, pinch, uh, put, dig, plucking, rolling, pressing, manipulating, and doing all those things with accuracy and precision. Um, when we talk about sensory processing, that's typically we think we have five senses, all as my, our OTs know, uh, we actually have seven senses. Those are touch or tactile, um, sight, sound, smell, and then the two that OTs like to focus on in pediatrics are called proprioception and your vestibular inputs. Um, so proprioception is just really the accuracy of um, your joint and muscle position and how that makes sense when it comes to movement. So understanding where your body is in space, increasing body awareness, and just understanding how to interact with our environments. Um, when we talk about vestibular sense, that's gonna be really just related to balance. Um, in the simplest way, um, you know, outdoor opportunities provide a ton of um, opportunities for challenging our vestibular processing. Um, and then overall, when we talk about sensory processing, the goal is to work on sensory integration, which is just the ability to take in the outside world um, and functionally organize that uh, for, again, best outcomes um, with performance and participation. So I'm going to play these two videos. Uh, they just talk about some of these ideas. And again, there's just a lot of good um, idea sharing with these videos. So try to get through these. Now 
professional organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that children play outside every day, um, in particular physical activity. So studies have found that um, children who are outdoors more are more likely to be physically active, which is important for their muscular development, their heart health, and for maintaining a healthy weight status. And I think um, being active from a young age sets a positive trajectory of active living and good health for later on in life. As a working parent of two young children, uh, I can appreciate the challenges in, in taking my children outside to play. The large part of the year when it's dark, after, after we get home from work, we might bundle up and take a flashlight and go for a walk. Um, we might invite some of our friends or neighbors to come along. I find that our children are um, more likely to be excited about being outdoors when they have their friends with them. Parents can be advocates for their children as far as getting outdoor time, even when children are not in their care. So um, for the lots of children who go to childcare or preschool or in the care of relatives or friends, I think parents can um, talk to those caregivers about why it's important for children to be outdoors and um, in the hours that they're, they're spending in those settings uh, to to help those care providers and settings also prioritize outdoor play for children. Okay, so just some ideas there. Uh, this one on the bottom right here is actually a um, organization that does teacher training, uh, training of uh, staff to, to better prepare them to work in the outdoors. So this is a really good one. Um, I'm going to full screen it because there's subtitles for a lot of it. Outdoor learning from the educators is related back to the daily outdoor activities, which range from half an hour to an hour. And the focus is actually more on motor skills. Outdoor learning is really a vital context for children's holistic development. It provides those opportunities for social development, physical development, emotional development. The Training of Trainers program has really been aimed at building the capacity of teachers to be able to take learning outdoors more than they currently do. If we want children to go outdoors, the teachers themselves need to be willing to go outdoors and join in with the children in those outdoor experiences. Now the aim is to think about the outdoors as an extension of what happens in the classroom, not just a place that I go and then I come back. We learned a lot about the theories, the pedagogical underpinnings that goes with outdoor learning and how that has actually made me reflect and informed about my practices as an educator for the young children. After I attended these two days workshop, I feel more confident to encourage my teachers to have more activities outside. What kind of like inhibit us from our desire to bring the children outdoor is the risk that could possibly be involved if you were to bring the children outdoor. But what we have learned in the workshop is that you know uh, we could do benefit risk assessment. We the important thing is to gain the confidence of the parents. As long as the risk assessment is being done, and I believe the parents will be assured that their kids are being well taken care of. This is a unique opportunity for this to be a learning journey for both teachers, but also for parents in sharing that information and rethinking about your know, outdoor learning and its benefits in a very different way. Okay, so there's one part of that that I really love. I love when she says um, we need to rethink the way we look at the outdoors um, as something that is not a place we go to and come back, but just part of learning overall. I love that. So let me see if I can get this. Presentation mode. Sorry about that. I don't do a lot of Zoom, actually. Let me see. All right, we'll get back. Okay, so just 
Back on that topic, the childhood developmental, um, two, uh, a couple that I didn't mention are uh, the ability to increase their stamina, strength, and immunity when um, children are involved in the outdoors. So um, let's look ahead at some outdoor play ideas. Um, so when we talk about outdoor play, uh, especially for a lot of the children, um, I know that, you know, in Ellenville, three to seven years old, um, free play is really important. It's really where they're going to develop a lot. I mean, academics is, of course, important, but uh, children that age need to be doing a lot of free play. Um, so when we talk about free play, those are active free play opportunities. We talk about um, imagination, and what I mean by that is a means over an end. Um, and then in the same vein, uh, activities that are child directed but adult structured so what I mean by that is um, being able to draw on the environment for supports um, looking at the process and not the product of whatever you're working on um, and then being able to pre-structure objects in the environment um, in a way that allows them to kind of create the play ch the children to create the play um, and then you can sort of further support their play opportunities um, with those objects and with the structuring uh, but again, it should be kind of child focused most of the time I know. And I know that becomes a challenge when we talk about some of the, the populations that we have um, on the spectrum, just because they can have a difficult time coming up with play ideas. Um, so again, the structuring is the important part. Every kid might need a little more structuring or a little less structuring when it comes to imagination and play. Um, number three, emphasizing the experience and not the outcomes. So let's, let's talk about drawing on our senses here um, and drawing on motor challenges and emotions that come from outdoor experiences. So um, this should be opportunities where we want our children to reflect and acknowledge their experiences and sort of think deeply um, and analyze what, you know, what was going on with their body when they were going for a walk. Were they feeling cold? Were you feeling warm? Did you feel the warmth of the sun? Did you feel the wind on your cheeks? Um, what did you see? What was the brightest thing you see? What's the biggest thing you see? What's the smallest thing you see? Um, what's your body doing? Did you, did you have to climb? Did you have to crawl? Did you have to jump? Um, just again, emphasizing the experience and drawing on the experience and not necessarily worrying about what the outcome of the, the play experience was. Um, so just right movement challenges. Again, my OTs are gonna know all about this stuff. Um, that just is where we allow and encourage exploration um, through movement and just providing opportunities um, for challenges that are, you know, risk taking, um, but not going to be unsafe. So finding that's what we mean by just right. Um, finding ways to confront the environment um, and kind of problem solve things. I mean, you know, children need to go out of their comfort zone to develop. They need challenges and the more opportunities they have to uh, successfully navigate challenges, whether they're movement challenges or environmental challenges, um, the more they're going to develop their abilities uh, with their own bodies and understanding what they can do um, as far as in interacting with people and the environment. So uh, number five, heavy work. This draws on the concept of proprioception. Again, that's that um, internal sense we have of where our body is in space, sort of our body awareness and how our joints and our muscles move uh, functionally. Heavy work are typically things like carrying, pushing, pulling, lifting, dragging, throwing, uh, stomping, jumping, running. Um, these, again, are all going to increase body awareness, adaptability of different loads and forces on the body, um, and they, that directly um, leads to better engagement and interactions uh, with the variety of environments. So um, the OTs can definitely talk more about the heavy work and the proprioception. Um, and then number six, challenging angles. This is going to deal with uh, vestibular inputs. Um, so when I say challenging angles, I mean letting kids spin, uh, go upside down, roll, and, and see the world from different directions. Uh, there's research that shows that uh, these types of things can help increase muscle tone, um, promote better posture, uh, increase the vestibular sense, which can then um, increase attention, balance, and things like eye coordination. So. Um, Here's a little chart up at the right, just, uh, just a suggested amount of outdoor play. And I know looking at these numbers, it's probably shocking to see like, wow, my, you know, my one to five year olds might be spending their entire day outside. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. In an ideal world, that's probably the best thing for them. So um, just to keep that in mind when you are structuring sort of some of your classroom curriculum or um, just some of your sessions with these kids. So loose parts. Loose parts is a concept um, 
basically just means things that can be easily moved, manipulated, built with, or adapted in the environment. A little video here, just kind of looking at um, structured opportunities with outdoor loose parts play. The goal of today was to create a play space that was open-ended for children to come and be creative and use the loose parts to build what they want to build and create what they want to create. It's not as common for children to be able to have the freedom to, to play based on their own devices and what, what they really want to do. It's important from like a healthy development perspective and I think it's important um, just from a creativity and imagination point of view. Um, children need to explore out their ideas um, because everybody's an individual and everybody should, should have the chance to really tap into to their interests. Okay, so I love that video. There's a lot of good examples of uh, ways we can use common items to um, structure different types of play opportunities that not only challenge motor development, but also critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, leadership, all that stuff. So um, some specific examples of what we call loose parts um, and definitely ones that we could find in the outdoors, you can bring from home um, or just kind of, these are all pretty low cost items. Um, you know, you're not going to break uh, break the bank on uh, your classroom budget with a lot of these um, they're around so things like swings ropes tires bikes wagons uh, baskets garden tables sensory tables climbing areas digging uh, jumping areas sticks rocks acorns pine cones leaves bugs bricks water hay bales dirt logs tarps and clothespins um, and I know that sounds like it's just a bunch of stuff you'll find around but then you need to be um, the creative adults here and kind of come up with ways to structure these. Um, I, you know, two, two hay bales and two tires, uh, there's thousands of uh, movement opportunities for children there. There's thousands of opportunities for motor challenges and ways to problem solve how to move uh, with those objects. Um, and then you add in a few small objects and there's really, you know, the, the limit is what you can come up with. So um, seven uh, ideas for putting this into practice over here on the left. Um, just some things to keep in mind if you're going to use loose parts. Uh, you want to strategically place them for prompting play. So uh, that might look like, you know, putting two objects that children can climb up and jump uh, from next to each other and kind of just allowing them to figure that out on their own. Um, putting things in places where they can be carried or built or uh, supported by the other structures in the environment. Um, just, you know, you guys know what your outdoor areas look like. Um, there's a lot, you know, a lot strategically that you can do there. Um, putting big with small, so maybe using a hay bale and a tire and then having a few acorns and pine cones and having children um, sort of move those items across their environment up and over different objects, underneath objects, things like that. Um, letting the children take ownership, that goes back to some of the active play ideas. Um, you know, that's going to be uh, their prerogative. And I know with a lot of the, the kids sometimes on the spectrum, again, they're going to need more prompting for the, um, the creative play ideas. So, you know, every kid's going to be different with that. Some are going to come up with 100 ideas the first time they see something. And some might take a little bit to develop um, their sense of how to use objects, which is fine. That's, that's, you can show them how to use objects in creative ways. So um, number four, don't offer too many at once. You know, don't put out 10 different things uh, that can be overwhelming and it can just be like, they might move from object to object and not really spend enough time uh, kind of creatively thinking how to, how can I use this object um, in a way that's going to challenge me. So put a few out, see what, what happens and see what works. And then um, Number five, rotate those items from time to time. Um, so put a couple out, maybe a couple weeks, let the kids develop their idea of how to play with them and then take those away and put some new ones out and see, see if they can come up with some new ideas. Um, provide tools for exploration experimentation. That's gonna be things like small shovels, um, rakes, little digging tools, uh, little bowls for carrying the small objects from one area to another. Um, just, you know, using some outdoor tools uh, to help kind of enhance the play opportunities there. And then number seven, letting, you know, let getting dirty happen. And I know that that's something that's non-traditional um, and that's something that you have to get parents on board with a lot of the time. Um, but I challenge you to take that on and I challenge you to incorporate 
getting dirty into your classroom days and see how it works for you. Um, also opportunities there for children to learn how to clean up after themselves. I got dirty playing, I need to go back into the classroom. Okay, let's take 15 minutes to clean ourselves off, to wash our hands, to get the dirt off our clothes, whatever it may be. Um, there's ways to make that a learning opportunity as well. So let's go. So environmental structuring, um, let's see here. Um, so just a few ideas when we talk about environmental structuring. This link here on the left um, is really great just for looking at ways to get the classroom outdoors and um, ways to structure your outdoor environment to uh, promote not only just play opportunities, but also um, some of the curriculum academic stuff. There's, there's good ways to um, structure a classroom lesson to be outdoors. Um, so natural and possible, when we talk about natural and possible, um, that just increases the um, opportunities for adventure or um, unpredictability and uh, increasing opportunities for creativity and imagination. Um, so utilize areas within walking distance. I know that the Ellenville campus, um, there's kind of a stream that's close by. Uh, there's some fields and parks that are close by, things like that. So, you know, we talk about uh, being able to be in walking distance. That's ideal. Um, anything really that you can get to that's a little different space outdoors, things like fields, woods, if you've got it, uh, even just like a big tree to sit under, um, streams, gardens, parks, if there's bike paths or trails nearby, um, even hills that they can roll down or play up, uh, play on, um, things like that. You know, if you can, if you can look at a map or just walk around your environment with the adults first and see what's, what's there, uh, you'd be surprised when you really take a look at what's there for opportunities. Uh, number three, setting guidelines and expectations. It's probably one of the main things. A lot of um, adults are, are hesitant for outdoor play just because it seems like there's a lot of risk and it's kind of, um, you know, there may be safety issues there. Um, just set guidelines and expectations with, with not only the students, but the parents. Uh, so two rules that I always go back to have to be seen by an adult, number one, and have to respect yourself, others, and the environment that you're in. Um, and you can obviously build on those based on uh, your kiddos. For integrating outdoor days into out academic curriculum, I touched on that a little bit. Um, just taking traditional academic lesson opportunities and doing them outdoors for a little while. Um, it just allows for more of like the whole body learning. Um, and I challenge you to, to find ways to make that creative uh, for your class. Um, using the environment as an inspiration. And this is what we talk about as what's known as like the third teacher. So the environment is um, inherently tied to learning. And if we're sitting in the classroom all day, that environment can get a little stale and then the learning opportunities can, um, you know, there, there's not as many abundant learning opportunities when you're not creating inspirational environments. Um, and what better way to do that than the outdoors? It's always changing, it's always different. Uh, planning for rainy days, and I don't mean planning for uh, inside activities on rainy days, I mean, planning to get your kids outside even when it's raining. They're gonna have to experience the elements in their life. We live in New York, four seasons. Um, it's important that they can handle a little rain, a little wind, a little cold. Um, you know, I wouldn't say have your kids go outside for an hour the first day that you're gonna plan a rainy day, maybe five minutes. Maybe start off with five minutes, we're gonna walk outside, we're gonna do a lap around our building in the rain, we're gonna come back inside and build off of that, see what works, see what didn't work. Um, seven, eating outside. One of my favorite things to do. Uh, lunch would be ideal. Lunch and snacks would be even better. Um, if you can only get outside for a snack, that's, that's fine too, um, at least once a day. Eight, increasing recess time and decreasing play rules. So that one doesn't really sit well with the educators. Um, but there's a lot of benefits to increasing re recess time, especially for the younger kids. Uh, we look at decreased uh, levels of obesity, increase in positive behaviors, increase in social skills, um, creativity and problem solving and a reduction in stress when children are provided with more recess time. Um, and not structured outdoor time, uh, decreased play rules, just let them go out and play. Again, structure the environments for them. Um, and then like I was touching on before, allowing time to clean off after the outdoor time. That's, that's, a, that's a learning opportunity in itself. It's part of establishing healthy routines. Um, and then you get to work on dressing skills, cleaning skills, all that fun stuff that um, my OTs know all about. So kind of getting low on time here. I'm gonna put this video on. I might jump around, let's see. Um, 
So this is about an outdoor school. See, I like the educator. I'm going to skip the parent and go right to the educator. My imagination. Traditional school, they might say, oh, this is the week that we're going to talk about uh, firefighters or community helpers. And what we do at the nature preschool is we say, let's go on a hike and see what's interesting. Whatever we have in nature, children are interested in because it's around them. It's how they explore. It's how they learn is their direct environment. And so if you create their direct environment to be completely immersed in the natural world, then um, you're never fighting for their attention. I think that this is the first generation that hasn't been out exploring in their own neighborhoods as much as previous generations. So most of us that are older had opportunities to engage in the natural world and to head off into the woods for a few hours, practice balancing, collect acorns, collect leaves, challenge ourselves to do things that we might not naturally do. Um, but this generation isn't. This generation is spending a lot of time indoors. They're spending a lot of time plugged in, which is not how our bodies are created to best experience the world. We are sensory animals. <laughs> we want to smell things and hear things and touch things. Kids need to jump up and down to feel that this is hard or this is soft. They really need to use their whole bodies. When you look around the playground, you know, you can see like the huts they've made out of sticks and, you know, like the gardens that they've made. And there's just like a lot of uh, ability to imagine, you know, outside. Jake often comes home covered from head to toe. Okay, so um, I love the way that the director of that school describes the outdoor uh, learning experience. She touches on a lot of OT concepts there. Um, and I just think it's great that that's becoming more of a, a mainstream thing with schools and education. So let's look at I think I have one more for you guys. Yeah, cool. So these are just some quick things to touch on. This video is really good, so I definitely want to show that one. I'll go through this list pretty quick. Um, you want to go outside every day? Yeah. Um, rain, sleet, snow, or shine. Um, you know, kids are going to have to deal with that as they grow up. Um, hopefully you can get the parents on board. Number two, educating parents. That's probably going to be one of your biggest challenges. Um, but as educators, if you're on board, if you're, if you believe in it, if you believe that there are benefits to this, um, you know, it's, it's about attitude and it's about, um, kind of a, a mindset about things too. So that's, that's something that as educators, you guys can work on. Um, by developing an outside committee, just people to, you know, sit, maybe meet once a week and talk about what you're planning for the outdoors that week, um, what it's going to look like, what you need to prepare, um, and make it fun. I mean, it, you know, the outside, should, it should be fun. It shouldn't be super stressful. It should be a good time for everybody. Um, for sharing resources and materials, uh, feel free to email me. I've, like I said, I've got a million resources. Um, there's a lot of people diving into this stuff now, and so there's a lot of different angles you get. You get educators, OTs, um, camp staff, you know, there's, it's really, it's awesome how many resources and um, different types of, of roles are getting involved with this. Um, number five, frequent movement breaks. So that kind of ties into, um, I'll get to that with 11 and 12 toward the bottom there. But um, frequent movement breaks, you know, you don't have to spend a ton of time outside every time you go outside. Just maybe a walk to one place and back, one minute, two minutes. That's really all it takes sometimes. Uh, number six, adequate free recess time. I talked about that a little bit. I'm a big proponent of just, you know, letting kids be kids. Uh, just as adults, our jobs to structure, and that's going to allow them opportunities to, to develop themselves and all those different areas we've already discussed. So, um, Emphasizing play over organized activities and increasing sensory motor um, outdoor opportunities. Again, this is all just the structuring stuff and um, I've kind of talked about that a little bit. So incorporating movement into the whole body learning experiences, that's going to draw back to um, looking at academic lessons and finding ways that, you know, we can make those whole body experiences. Um, Developing project-based outdoor curriculum. So again, that's gonna tie into the outside committee. Maybe once a week, you guys have one outdoor project you're working on um, and you take a little of your curriculum lesson time to focus on the outdoor project-based activity. Uh, again, that's gonna work on things like leadership, teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking, which are you know, just as important as being able to add one plus one. Um, so reducing periods of static sitting and attending. Uh, I suggest less than 10 minutes because I know personally, I have a hard time if I have to sit down and listen to something for a long time. So even this 45 minute presentation, I'm sure some of you have wanted movement breaks just throughout this. Um, kids, they need it even more. That could just be moving from sitting to standing to laying, all different ways of interacting in the environment. 
Um, that ties right into 12, changing positions often every 15 to 20 minutes. And then 13, thinking beyond the chair. So logs, benches, um, balls, whatever you've got, not only in the classroom, but outdoors, rocks, um, trees, different things to, to sit on and learn on. So I want to play this video, and then I think that's the last thing I've got before questions. So um, I'll start this now. Here's a musical playground where everybody's dreams come true musically. And oh musically. <laughs> and then some people sometimes our, our music teachers bring us on our on this good old playground. And at and um at recess we come out here too. I like that I can like make music while I'm in nature. Yeah. The outdoor pavilion is used for like reading when people don't want to be stuck in the classroom. Sometimes if we need more space, we can do science projects out here, or sometimes we just feel like we need a more peaceful environment, and we just come out here to learn. So this right here is our <laughs> kindergarten art board. It's kind of, kids kind of come out here and doodle on them at recess, or if they want to come outside to do their work, they'll bring like Expo markers and come draw over here. But also, in different grades, we also did this like math relay race, and they wrote our, some of our math problems on these, so they're also really, also useful to like write down equations and problems and stuff. So yeah, laughing a lot. It can be used as a bullet bar. <laughs> <laughs> our school has a garden. Yes, we have a garden. We sometimes for science or other um, activities will also our class can volunteer to come out here and plant or. Um, check on different things and these have names of like different plants. This is our butterfly garden. We made it just so um, they're all plants and we made it mostly so butterflies and other pollinators would come and see all the plants and pollinate the plants for us. This is the Douglas Outdoor Theater. So this is basically where some people read to self, and sometimes either if it's class, if it's a class out here, and we're reading to some, we're reading to the whole class. We would usually either sit out here and and listen to other people. Okay, so um, that's what I've got. The last thing I'm gonna just touch on is I know um, there's unique challenges living in a post-COVID world, especially when we talk about being back in school. Um, the outdoors really does, in my opinion, ease a lot of those challenges. Um, you know, there's ways we can interact and socialize and be involved together um, in learning in the outdoors uh, that doesn't necessarily um, pose risks when it comes to, to safety when we, we talk about um, being back at school. So um, with that, are there any questions? I can pull up the uh, chat box here and see about that. Um, so David, whoops, I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't, I'm sorry for that echo. Um, um, Phenomenal stuff, yeah. Dave. And then here we, is, sorry, one more thing. If anybody- Yeah, please. Uh, let me see if this would go all the way to the end. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any more questions or just wants to chat about this type of stuff or wants some of the resources I talked about, um, anything at all, there's my email. Feel free to contact me. Um, there's also a link to my website. It's www.accessoutdoorsot.com. Um, again, that's just got more resources, more information in different angles for looking at these types of things. Yeah, whomever. Um, we talk about outdoor education. So uh, thanks for uh, listening, and I hope that was some helpful information for you guys and some, some things to, to consider moving forward.
Okay, Dave, that, yeah. Um, Melissa had just, I know we are, we are getting ready to take a break and then start another one. Melissa just put a quick um, question in the chat and she says, just wondering what we would say to parents about taking kids out due to ticks. Parent, okay. as you know, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, yeah, that's definitely something we, we deal with here in New York. Um, you know, I would say personally that ticks are really, only going to be a major factor if we're in heavily wooded areas. Typically, um, if you're on trails or paths in the woods, um, you're not really going through the thick areas of the woods where it might be a bigger issue. Um, I would suggest just having them bring long pants, long shirts, um, and then you know part of that's going to be on the parents when the kids get home to just do you know like a tick check. I mean, when I was a kid, if I came home and I was playing in the woods. Um, I would be doing tick checks just to make sure. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I would say to, to parents. Anybody else have any questions or, or comments, even just comments I, for Dave? I know Elizabeth, you gave Elizabeth, you know, Elizabeth and I a lot of great ideas. Boy, if we I mean, if we had our way, this would be a forest preschool, kindergarten, first grade. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, it's definitely, um, there's there's people that are on board and there's people that are a little more hesitant with some of these things. And, and you know, I think just the more you research and the more you read about some of these ideas and um, everyone should get a copy of this book because it's it's got everything in there. Um, it's it's okay. Like your, your, the kids will be okay going outside, you know, like if anything, the inside is doing them, um, being indoors all day, being structured, being on screens. That's not the way in my mind. And in a lot of people that study this minds, um, ways that humans develop. So, um, it's challenging and it's definitely, uh, sort of a progressive way of thinking, but in the same sense, it's a way of, uh, getting back more traditionally to, um, what humans need when we talk about development. So um, there's a lot of conversations to be had with parents there. Um, and, you know, it's baby steps. You know, I wouldn't hit everybody with um, everything I just said all at once, but um, small steps to get there. So. All right, Dave. And with that, 